Well, hi, guys. Yet again, you're here with old Barry. Uh, listen, uh, when you've walked the walk yourself, you, you pretty much almost know instantly whether someone's real or not. Um, I want to take a minute, okay, and introduce a lot of my subscribers, readers, however you want to term it, to a guy named Paul Wallace. Um, gosh, I, I, I've watched much of his stuff and I've read, uh, I've read quite a bit of his stuff also. Um, a very interesting character and that started out in one direction. If you want to read up about his life, uh, he's all over the internet and then kind of started doing his own apophatic research. And to someone who's put the time into this, And how it's delivered both in his authorings and on his videos. I think a lot of my subscribers will appreciate that type of frequency. As hard as it may be to accept for many people. When someone puts the time into it, much the same as the mentors have. No matter how unlikely or how your personal belief or thought or science didn't lead you down that path, when you're left with the only thing that opens almost all the locks, generally you're on to the right information. And that's tremendously time consuming. But much of Wallace's material does just that. And um, if you've taken the time like the mentors have and have done your own research layer by layer, you'll, you'll pretty much come up with the same answer as hard as it is to, to believe. Anyway, I want you to watch this short clip and uh, I'll, I'll pick it up on the other side, but it brings up uh, one of the most key points I've mentioned to my subscribers over and over and over again. Let's see if you pick it up on the video, okay? We'll catch you on the other side. My contribution is in the area of paleocontact. My book, Escaping from Eden, asks the question, does Genesis teach that the human race was created by God or engineered by ETs? And my book, The Scars of Eden, asks, has humanity confused the idea of God with memories of ET contact? And the journey and research that led to those books was for me a real process of unlearning and relearning, unraveling old paradigms and re-educating myself and reframing my thinking. But how do we do that? How do we unlearn and relearn? Well, to illustrate that, let me tell you about my grandparents. Now, my grandmother was born 110 years ago, just before the invention of what we call modern medicine with the discovery of penicillin. Now, I was reminded of my grandparents' contribution to my life at the very time that I was beginning my journey of research for Escaping from Eden. And at that time, I had a good friend who was keeping me supplied with a steady flow of natural, organic, whole foods. Pickled foods fermented foods, homebrewed beers and wines, nettle teas. And then one day my wife Ruth said to me, Paul, what's that funny smell in the pantry? And I went and smelt the pantry and I thought, oh my goodness, that is what my grand's pantry used to smell like. Now, as I say, my grand was born 110 years ago in a house with no plumbing, no running water, no electricity, and because of no refrigeration, she grew up with quite a different way of eating. Now, my grand and grand lived in a terrace of 16 houses, all with very long strip gardens, and they all grew their own food in their back gardens. My grand and grand had a little orchard of trees and a fantastic vegetable patch. Most of the gardens had decent vegetable patches. One had chickens, one kept goats. Another household, the dad was really good at sort of household engineering things. And simply through participating in a shared economy, 
That was how those households made it through the very challenging years of the Depression, nearly a hundred years ago, producing their own foods and pooling their resources. So by the time I came on the scene, that generation had accrued a lot of wisdom through that lifestyle. And so if you were injured, that generation would find you a dock leaf or some honey or some butter or a cobweb. If you had a chemical imbalance in your body, bloating, a headache, that generation would get you a nettle tea, some dandelion and burdock, a copper bracelet, a salt bath, a vinegar wrap. But I was of a generation which by the 1970s had been trained to respond, oh, no thanks, Gran, I've got a pill for that. Nettle tea, oh, no thanks, Gran, I've got a pill for that. Copper bracelets, oh, no, I'll pop a pill for that and take some anti-inflammatories, thanks. Where did that skepticism and that disrespect come from? Well, the answer is that at the same time that those 16 households were navigating the Depression, Frederick Banting was isolating insulin. Alexander Fleming had just isolated penicillin. So there was this massive leap forward in managing diseases with pharmaceuticals. Post-war, government siphoned hundreds of millions of dollars of public money into the pharmaceutical industry. And the pharmaceutical industry was siphoning tens of millions into universities and medical schools to embed in our culture the ideas of a pill for every ill and a patent for every pill. So by the time, half a century later, I was saying, oh no thanks Gran, I've got a pill for that, Every doctor I'd ever seen, every hospital I'd ever visited, every pharmacy I'd ever patronized, every magazine I'd ever read, every radio show I'd listened to, every TV documentary I'd watched, had sent me the same message. No thanks, Gran, I've got a pill for that. It was my gut reaction because massive corporations and governments had spent hundreds of millions of dollars establishing that culture and getting that message across. Now, I don't share that because I'm anti-medicine, far from it. In my own lifetime, I've seen massive leap forwards in disease control and the prevention of appalling life-ruining conditions. I'm tremendously grateful for advances we've made in the area of pharmaceuticals. But I share that story just to point out that governments and corporations do spend a lot of money to shift culture and to shift our thinking. And it had become an unthinking, instinctual response of mine because of those decades of powerfully funded entrainment. And that particular entrainment had taught me and those in two generations really to reject ancestral knowledge, write it off as home remedies and old wives tales, and separate ourselves really from the wisdom of our ancestors. For another example, I watched how my grandparents ate, and I watched with some horror at the diet they ate that had a lot of natural fats in it because I believed that fat was bad and that you should eat a low-fat diet. The reason I thought that was because the sugar industry had spent tens of millions of dollars shifting our thinking to move us away from eating natural fats to eating foods that are sugar-based or corn syrup-based. I had no idea that I was part of an education program, but I was. And it took decades before I realized that my thinking had been shaped by disinformation from a body of corporations that was simply out there to make money from their product. At the same time, because my grandparents didn't get everything right, I also watched with horror as my grandparents smoked like 
chimneys, dozens of cigarettes every day, reassured by the adverts that told them that doctors smoke camels. I remember looking through my grand's women's weeklies from the 1950s that she kept in her shed out in the backyard. And I was fascinated by these old adverts and especially by the ones where there were opera singers saying, my doctor tells me to smoke because it helps with my singing. Well, with that level of entrainment, of course my grandparents thought there was no harm in smoking a few dozen cigarettes every day. Only now do we realize there was active disinformation with tens of millions of dollars behind it to shift our culture in a direction that was actually very damaging to human health. So I share those stories just to point out that what we think, what we have learned is shaped by governments and corporations. What we learn from our school textbooks will have tens of millions of dollars behind it as well. So how do we get a perspective? How do we reflect on what we have received from our education and entrainment and have the distance to be able to say, well, that makes sense, that doesn't make sense. How do we take a step back? Well, I talked about my grandparents as a way of suggesting that one thing we can do is to listen to our elders, listen to our ancestors, listen to the oldies. And it won't be that they will have everything right, but they will have carried knowledge that we haven't received from the present. And that's how we begin to get a wider mix of information to get a perspective. And then think about it, reflect on it, apply logic to what we're hearing and observing. Every generation has its blind spots. But if we can listen across the generations, then I think we can probably navigate better. In a world so dominated by corporate dollars, how do we get a perspective? Well, I would suggest listen to smaller media. Listen to the media that don't have big corporate budgets behind them. And again, it's not that every small media outlet or every podcaster is going to get everything right, but it just gives you a wider array of information and then you can make your call. You can listen to ancestral advice. You can listen to all the medical advice from around the world. You can get a range of information and then apply logic to what you're seeing and hearing. I've heard from so many people in the last couple of years who've told me my world has changed because I started binge watching YouTube and I discovered the Fifth Kind TV or Full Spectrum Universe or Watchers Talk, or London Real, or Portal to Ascension. The small media, the ones without corporate dollars behind them. And often what's shared on those platforms is what we are unlearning from our entrainment of the present day and relearning from our ancestors. And my learning journey for escaping from Eden and the scars of Eden has been a matter of relearning from our ancestors. And as I continue on that path, I'm on the research path for the sequel to The Scars of Eden, I'm making a very special effort to sit at the feet of elders of traditional cultures from Southern Africa, from Native America, from Aboriginal Australia, and from the Philippines in particular. These are the avenues I'm pursuing right now because I want to listen to the oldies, to the elders, to our ancestors, for the information that they have carefully curated for thousands of years. It's as I listen to ancestral story from cultures around the world that I learn about paleo contact, our ET roots, and our place in the cosmos. Shamanic and mystical practices that can help us activate our human potential and learn some things that I never read in my school textbooks or heard on the TV news. When I was a boy, my gramp taught me to count to 10 
in his native language, which was Welsh. Ian, die, tri, pedwar, pimp, chweoch, seith, with, now, dig. And when he taught me those numbers, my grant was teaching me a language that it was forbidden for him to speak at school for fear of a caning, for fear of corporal punishment. Why? Because in 1284, the English government, the English crown, annexed Wales and began a process that really was an attempt to extinguish Welsh culture. In 1536, Henry VIII made the Welsh English, and that's why there's no Welsh flag in the Union flag of the United Kingdom, because the Welsh were now English. And then by the time my gramp was at school, there was a policy in place in the schools of the Welsh knot. And what that meant was that any child found speaking Welsh would have to wear a wooden board around their neck saying Welsh not, and the only way they could get rid of it was to snitch or dob in another child who was speaking Welsh, and then they would get to wear the board, and whichever child was wearing the board when the school bell went at the end of the day would be thrashed. And that was the school education department's policy for obliterating the Welsh language, because if you get rid of that, how can you have Welsh culture? How can you read Welsh literature? How can you retain Welsh memory? And it really was an attempt to really make the Welsh English and make the continuation of Welsh culture a non-viable option. Empires always seek to extinguish the culture of the peoples they conquer. And so the Welsh were forbidden from speaking Welsh at school. African slaves in America were forbidden from speaking their own languages or using their own names. It's why Aboriginal Australian children in the 20th century were taken by force from their families and held in youth detention centres for reprogramming by church authorities. It's why the indigenous priests of Central and South America were executed and their books burned when the Catholic forces of Spain and Portugal went into that continent to take it for Portugal, Spain and the church. Basically, empire always seeks to delete and replace the old knowledge so that the imperial authorities become the department of truth. So in the Scars of Eden, I go back to the indigenous people who were conquered and suppressed and sit at the feet of the elders of those cultures and read the ancient texts that have survived from those cultures to find what has been forgotten. And so I go to Wales and I hear the story of Tilworth Tig, which is the story of another presence on planet Earth, a non-human presence that is interested in humanity and from time to time abducts human beings and takes them to underwater bases where they're used as part of a hybridization program. And then often after a few years, they're returned uh, sound and healthy. It's a bizarre story and yet it repeats around the world. So if I go to African peoples and sit at the feet of the elders of their traditional cultures, I will hear exactly the same story from the Kenyans. I'll hear of the Mahurani. From Ghanaians, I will hear of Mamiwata. It's the same story as Tilworth Tig. In Nigeria, Cameroon and Southern Africa, I'll hear about the Ojisu or Sanabua, Abasi and Atai, Unkulunkulu, all these stories that speak of beings coming from the stars, colonizing our planet in the distant past, and genetically engineering our ancestors. These are the forgotten stories of those cultures. If I go to Central and South America and listen to the stories that come out of the Aztec and the Mayan traditions, I will hear exactly the same thing in the stories of Quetzalcoatl, Cucumats, Cucucan, Viracocha. Every detail repeating. If I go to Aboriginal Australia, I will hear a story that takes me back into geological time, which can only mean previous civilizations. 
And so again, if we're asking how to get some perspective in a world of misinformation and disinformation, sit at the feet of the elders of indigenous cultures. Listen to the locals. So how to unlearn the entrainment and disinformation of corporations and empires? How to get perspective on the information in which we're awash in the present day? One, go to ancestral knowledge, and two, go to the elders of the cultures that have been conquered and suppressed. Sit at their feet and relearn what has been forgotten. And thirdly, I would say listen to the esoteric traditions, because when ancient cultures have been conquered and suppressed, the information that they have curated doesn't disappear, it goes underground. And so the descendants of those executed priests will take the books that have not been burned and they will safeguard them. This is the story of the Gnostic Gospels that were dug up out of the Nag Hammadi Desert. It's the story of the Popol Vuh that was retrieved after 200 years being underground, kept in the Quiche text, and then delivered to Francisco Jimenez at the beginning of the 1700s. What happens is the knowledge goes underground, it's curated by secret societies, who then leak that information back into the mainstream through story, through shamanic practices, through art. And those things are all intertwined. Go to ancestors, our ancestral wisdom. Go to the indigenous peoples who've been conquered and go to the esoteric traditions that have carried ancient knowledge. One person who did those three things supremely was Plato, who lived two and a half millennia ago. And in his books, Phaedo and Timaeus and Critias in particular, he retrieves information and builds a case for his worldview out of those three sources. He applies logic to things we all observe. So here's this great array of information that he's gathered. He's now gonna think about it systematically and he'd encourage you to do the same. And then secondly, he goes to these forgotten ways. He goes to the knowledge of a conquered Egypt, knowledge that was curated by the ancient Egyptian priesthood. And he retrieves that for a new age. And then he also goes to esoteric traditions and he mentions the Eleusinian mysteries. And this was a spiritual cult that existed in ancient Athens. And when they came to him and they said, oh, we've got an interesting tea we'd like you to drink, he didn't say, oh, no, thanks, Gran, I've got a pill for that. He took the tea and it enabled him to engage with information from other dimensions and to interact with other kinds of entity. And he's very open, he's speaking in the voice of Socrates when he says this, but I think he's speaking out of an internal knowledge as well. Plato brought all those together, and that was his answer to the question of how do we unlearn from the conventions that have shaped us, get a critical distance, and then think afresh for ourselves and come to new conclusions. I would encourage anyone who is a seeker, anyone who has an appetite for learning and discovery, to follow all those paths. I find it incredibly enriching for myself. It's resulted in escaping from Eden and the scars of Eden in my own case, and I'm sure will continue to lead me in my journey of research into the future. Okay, so how many of my longtime readers knew uh, what little tip I was saying? Um, it's interesting, the first mentioning, after announcing the two books that he's authored, I'm quoting, so I'm going to read the following two lines. I want to get it word for word. Quote, for me, it was really a process of unlearning and relearning, unrattling old paradigms and re-educating myself, reframing my thinking. 
Then for the balance of the video, which everybody should watch, he goes about how to begin doing it for him. And that's where I'm going to briefly just say a couple of points. Uh, I can only tell you when you've done it yourself, and believe me, uh, the way I was raised in the belief patterns and, and the, uh, just the outlooks in so many different areas, um, it took me years of unlearning. It was, that was, without a doubt, the most miserable part of the whole scenario. But if you can do it, you will be the one that's calm when others are freaking out. You'll be the one that can pretty much say, no matter what it is, I'll handle it and actually mean it and believe it yourself. And it's just a whole different type of frequency. So anyway, I hope you guys got something out of it. It doesn't have to always be on the negative side. And really, start tuning into higher frequencies because if you can't unlearn, once the vessel's full, it cannot accommodate any more. Okay, if it's an 8-ounce vessel, it's full at 8 ounces. You've got to let something out before you can acquire new. Hey guys, it's Old Barry. Bye.